Hello and welcome! This is Rufalmonger. And friends, this is my beginner's guide to Street Fighter 6. I know a lot of people are trying Street Fighter for the first time ever, and if you need a little bit of a helping hand, well, that's exactly what this video is for. So, for your benefit, I'm covering a lot of subjects in this video, so there is timestamps. So skip forward to whatever makes the most sense for you. Although, if you could leave a like, that would be greatly appreciated. So we do all have to start somewhere, so let's start at the start and start with the absolute basics of the game. So the basics of Street Fighter VI. So Street Fighter as a series is a little bit different than other fighting games, as it's a six button game. Other fighting games, they're usually like four or five buttons. Street Fighter, no, 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 six buttons. So we have light punch, medium punch, heavy punch, light kick, medium kick, heavy kick. And while well, light attacks are the fastest, heavy attacks are the slowest, but do the most damage and mediums are, well, somewhere in between. And the fact that it's a six button game is what gives Street Fighter a lot of its depth. Because not only is it six basic attacks here on the ground, it's also six attacks while crouching. It's also six different attacks while jumping and just going on from there and also all sorts of what we call command normals so for like say ryu we have medium punch but we also have forward and medium punch we have heavy punch but we also have back and heavy punch we have heavy kick but we also have forward and heavy kick so on and so forth so not only do you have the main buttons a lot of the buttons can also be modular character to character so six buttons is the core of the game and that's what gives street fighter a lot of the street fighter magic also, this has to do with our special moves. So there's many kinds of motions. There could be quarter circle forwards, like down to down, forward to forward. And say you do that direction with a punch button, and that gives us Ryu's legendary fireball, right? Say down to back, so down, down, back, back. That'll give us a hurricane kick. And then things like the dragon punch motion, which is forward, down, and down, forward. And if you do it all together, then you get the dragon punch. So just like the regular buttons themselves, the button you press matters quite a bit. So say the fireball. So the fireball, no matter what button you press, does 600 damage. So, well then Rufamonger, why wouldn't I just do the heavy fireball always? It's the fastest one, therefore should be the best, right? Well, not quite. So this is where we get into the weeds with a lot of frame stuff. So yes, the heavy fireball is indeed the fastest, for sure. But we see here, we have our little frame data meter. If we do it point blank, we're negative. We are disadvantaged after the fact. Yet if we do say the light one point blank, okay, well we're negative sure, but now we're only negative one versus negative five. What's the deal here? Well, it has to do with recovery. So if you see the frame data meter here, when I attack the blue part of the bar, that's how long it takes me to recover. And the Fierce, the heavy Hadoken, takes longer to recover because it's a faster move, so therefore there's a little bit of a penalty associated with it. So say we're in a situation here where the opponent jumps our fireball. It can be very real and simple as if you do the light version, you'll have time enough to block, but if you do the heavy version, you'll get hit in the head. So that's one of the reasons why you would want to pick a different button. Even if it does the exact same damage, even if it's quote unquote faster and better, the light version, you might be able to block in time where the heavy version, you might not be able to block in time. And of course, that's just Ryu. Say we go to Dalsum. He's a character with multiple fireballs as well, including a very fancy upwards going fireball. The light version is a very high but shallow arc, so it lands very close to you. Versus the heavier versions, well, it goes just about full screen, right? So if you're this far away, the heavy version's useless to you. It's only the light version you really want because it's close to the enemy. So button presses matter. One more example. So let's take Zangief. All versions of his big fancy spinning pile driver are five frames. And the heavy one does the most damage. So if they're all the same speed and same recovery, why would I not just only do the heavy version, right? Because it does the most damage. Well, there's a reason. From right around here, this distance, heavy will not connect. But the light version will. Yes, the light version does not do as much damage but it'll hit from ranges the heavy version simply cannot. And that's very useful. In fact, in a lot of ways, the light version is more useful than the heavy one because specifically of that range. So yes, just like every button has its use, light, medium, heavy, 
due to its speeds, its damages, and properties. Every special move the button presses also have their own tale to tell. The button press for each special move will give you very different results. So that out of the way, some basic movement. This is a game where you can dash forward and backwards. Basically the dash, you give up control of your character for a very short amount of time, but you gain a quick burst of speed. You cannot block in any way to, while you're just dashing. You cannot defend yourself while dashing. So only dash when you feel it's safe. Also the back dash does have a defensive property as back dashes cannot be thrown. So if you feel a throw coming, either a regular throw or say that big nasty Zangief throw, if you back dash out, you're scot free, you're good to go. Another very important concept is wake up. So obviously as the game progresses, someone's gonna hit you and you're gonna get knocked down. That's just life, right? So normally if you don't do anything, you just wake up in place. In this scenario here against Kami specifically, when she dashes forward after the fact, she will have pretty significant advantage over you. If you press buttons together, she's always gonna beat you. So that's no good. But if you happen to hit buttons while you're waking up, you will do a back roll. And while she's still close to you, it's at least a little further away, you have a bit more space. And against a lot of characters too, if you are getting up in place, they can be directly on top of you. However, if you hit buttons when you wake up and back roll, then you'll have a little bit just more space to breathe. Things will be a lot easier. Now there is certain kind of knockdowns that are hard knockdowns and it'll tell you so on the screen. A hard knockdown, you cannot back roll. So you'll always wake up in place fixed no matter what. So keep that in mind because hard knockdowns are very good because they control your movement. So that said, that's the absolute basics. Now let's talk meters. So now let's talk meters, both the super meters, that's this guy here below, and your drive gauge, that's this guy here above with the green bars below your health, both incredibly important. First, we'll talk the super meters. So the super bar, it goes up to three maximum, as you can see here. So you start out at zero, and over the course of the fight, you'll build the one, the two, the three, and every character has three super moves, and they use one, two, and three bars, respectively. So for Ryu as our base here, let's give you an example. His level one is the Shinku Hadoken, and Shinku Hadoken is a big old fast projectile, multi-hits, does good damage for a projectile. Sure, great. His level two is a super version of his new Hashogeki super, which knocks the enemy back and you can hold it. And if you hold it, well, the results get a lot better in terms of the damage. Also a lot better in terms of the effect as it causes a rollout state, which you can then combo from and uh, that damage is pretty big. And of course, naturally his level three, the Shin Shoryuken. And this does the most damage by itself of any of the special moves. And this is pretty much going to be the case for every character. Level three is the most damaging. So is it a case of, well, is one super always better than the other? Is three always better than two, always better than one? Not so much. So let's take an example here of E Honda. So E Honda, he's doing good in this game, but what he doesn't have is something like that. He doesn't have the invincible reversal move, the uppercut style move. Lots of characters do, E Honda does not. So he needs his super moves to have something like that. Thankfully, he does. His level one super, which just slams you all the way across the screen, that is for the most part invincible. It loses the throws, but beats everything else, right? So that's great. So if you're in a position where you're being pressured, this is the move you can use to invincible through the attack and go forward. Not everyone's level ones have the same kind of invincibilities or same properties, but this is a reason here, Honda, his level one comes from his super meter, not his drive meter or anything like that. But that's the idea here. For Honda, one of his main defensive tools comes from his super meter. Also for Honda specifically, it's very interesting because it's actually razor quick and you can combo into it very easily where other moves might not be able to combo and get some decent damage from it. So for him, a level one is great. It's more than just something you tack on the end of the combo, although you can. It's also a strong defensive move for him where he's a character that otherwise does not have very good defense. Now let's pick a level two example, Zangief. Zangief, one thing he hates more than anything else is fireballs. Zangief is big and slow, so fireballs is always something he struggled with. Yes, he does have the spinning lariat, 
which lets them go through fireballs to a degree, but it's not like it's particularly quick. It just helps him inch forward just a little bit. He can't really stop you from throwing fireballs until he's earned his way in. Except the level two gives him a specific amount of utility. When he has two bars, those fireball people better start watching their fireballs. Because two bars, Zangief, he can punish you from pretty far away. So now, this ghost fireball we've been using for JP, we have Zangief and we have two bars, at least. We have three, but we have two bars at least. Now let's see what he can do. So as we're trudging our way in, oh, I caught you. And when you know it, his level two has a bit of a vacuum effect. So while he's working his way in now, he can just stop. He doesn't have to work his way in. Now the onus is on the person throwing the fireballs. Okay, are you gonna keep throwing fireballs? Because if you do and I catch you, you're got. You just got sucked into my move and you're gonna take a pretty sizable chunk of damage. So now with two bars, the entire game plan shifted. It's much more than just, I you know hit you with the combo, I have two bars so therefore I get more damage, right? That's nice, it obviously works, but it's much more than just that. Now it's an entire threat matrix. And a lot of characters are like this, especially their level twos. A lot of characters level twos are, this is now, okay, I'm gonna introduce something new to the game. I'm gonna have something I can do I normally can't otherwise provide. So this is the strength of some level two supers. And yes, level threes. Level threes are the big dumb super for the most part. The ones that let you get all the damage in. So you can tack these big fancy moves pretty much the end of any combo you can think of. And uh, due to them being level threes, they always will do a set amount of minimum damage no matter how long the combo is. So you can rest assured it's always gonna hurt no matter what. Now, one thing that's very specific to level threes. So level threes, well, they got these big fancy elaborate animations as you can see, right? And you know, they always do good damage. As you can see here now, level three, if done by itself, does 4,000 damage. That's a lot. However, they can be turbocharged. So now if you look at our, our bar here, right? It says three. Now, if you happen to be low health specifically, if you are low health, the level three down changes to CA, your critical art. And not only are you gonna do more damage, the animation will change as well. So now it did 4,500, which obviously is more than 4,000. It's not tons more, but that could be exactly what you need to close out a round. So this is the closest thing Street Fighter VI has to a comeback mechanic. Street Fighter VI is actually uh, quite a bit more unforgiving than a lot of modern fighting games, even modern Street Fighters. But this is basically your only comeback potential if you happen to be low on health, that your level three will do more damage than otherwise normally would. So now let's talk the drive gauge meter. That is the green bars below your health. And no word of a lie, this is almost as important as your actual health bar. The game, the entire game of Street Fighter VI is built around this meters here. This is what the game is. So on a base level, it lets you do most of your cool things. Drive rushes, which we'll talk about later. Drive impact, which we'll talk about later. Your parry mechanic, which we'll talk about later. And also things like special moves. Like, that's a cool special move. But if you spend some bars, it'll be faster, better, stronger, and just all around enhanced. So in a lot of games, you might call these EX moves. In this game specifically, it's OD moves, overdrive moves. And it's usually as simple as do whatever special move and hit two buttons instead of one. Now, when you spend that meter to enhance a move, it can be all sorts of things. It could be as simple as it does more damage. It could gain new properties. Like say for Guile, Say Guile here, he has the infamous Flash Kick. And Flash Kick's really good as an anti-air, but by itself, not so much. So Flash Kick's really good, but the problem is, in and of itself, there's no invincibility, so I can just smack him out of it, right? He's trying to do it on his wake up, but it doesn't matter. It's never gonna connect, because I'm hitting him out of it. But if he's choosing to spend the Drive Gauge Meter to enhance it, now, all of a sudden, same scenario, he's gonna beat me. Like, my timing is not any different. It's just his move's now full invincible. So, you know, that's really great. So it adds a strong defensive property. Some enhanced moves add strong offensive properties. Like say, Marissa's big Superman punch. If you do the enhanced version of it, 
see the enemy splats against the wall, right? And this means I can get a bit of a combo follow-up. I can get a lot of extra damage. So it's not just that the move itself gives me more damage, it gives me the opportunity to get more damage. And across the board, across the cast, all sorts of moves have tons of properties. Like I, I'm not gonna go exhaustive detail here, but basically the world's your oyster. If you were willing to spend some of these meters, you can wildly change up how moves work. And the thing is, cause the drive gauge is so good and the things it offers you is so amazing, you gotta watch out. Cause it ain't free. If you use it all up, you're in the burnout state. Now you can see here, Marissa's like kind of gray. Her whole stance has changed. She's a bit more scared, right? Cause that gray bar there is refilling. And until it refills, one, you can't use any of those cool drive gauge moves at all. And two, well, you might lose the game now cause burnout's really bad. So one of the big disadvantages here is when you're in this state, special moves now do chip damage. And this is permanent damage, this is not recoverable, and yes, it can kill you. So that's a lot of life to lose just for blocking everything, right? So while you're in a state, you can defend every move properly and you still might actually lose because you're gonna lose a lot of life to chip damage. It also changes the dynamics of everything. Like this move here, we have the frame data. So it says it's negative three. So it means it's slight disadvantage. It's not like Guile oh, could punish me necessarily, but uh, I'm at disadvantage, so it would be unwise to hit another button after he blocks it. So negative three. However, once you're in the burnout state, now it says it's plus one. So I'm at advantage now. So if we we're both to hit a button right after the fact, I'd probably win. Every move that you block in burnout state has four additional frames of advantage. So if the move is negative, it might become plus, and if the move's plus, well, it might become really plus, really advantage on block. So you take chip damage and your defense just gets worse all around. So don't go and burn out. And as you've probably seen by now, just even the act of blocking moves takes a little bit of your drive gauge. It's not that you are at full liberty just to spend every single gauge you have. The enemy can take it away from you and force you into the burnout state. Marissa specifically is one of the characters better at it because their big punches take so much drive gauge damage, it can force you into the state. Some people are better at it, some people are worse. But yeah, it's both a push and pull. That you want to spend it to beat the enemy, but the enemy attacking you can also drain it. So it'll recover over time, sure, but the burnout state, you really, really got to watch out for. So that said, we talked some of the basics around it, also overdrive moves, but let's talk some of the fancy, specific, unique mechanics that you get from the drive gauge and all that it offers you. So first let's talk the drive parry. So this is your medium punch and medium kick together, or you can bind it to a shortcut, doesn't matter. And the parry's about what you think it is. It'll just deflect just about any old thing. So say old man can here, he just lost a lot of money on cryptocurrency, right? He's raging. So he's throwing all sorts of fireballs. And yeah, it's easy enough to defend every one of these, right? But as we talked about earlier in the uh, drive gauge meter section, every time you block, you know, you're, you're going to lose some of that drive gauge, right? So eventually, if you just block everything, you're going to go into burnout state. But this is where the parry comes into play. So the parry does have an initial cost. It costs you half a bar. So it's not free necessarily. However, it does also get bar back whenever you block something. And if something say happens to be multiple hits, like say an EX fireball, then it would also get you multiple hits a meter back. So you can actually be positive meter on multi-hitting moves. So at the bare minimum, it's a defensive mechanic that'll help you not get burnt out, but it's obviously so much more. The best way to think of the basic parry is, is it simply a damage shield. It's your fortress mode. It's your armor lock if you remember Halo Reach, right? When you have it up, for the most part, you cannot be hurt. It doesn't matter if it's one hit like we saw earlier. It doesn't matter if it's a whole whack of hits. As long as you're holding this button, regular hits simply cannot affect you no matter what. It's pretty much that cut and dry. You're holding those buttons, you're safe. The thing you're not safe against, however, is throws. If you are parrying, you can be thrown and you cannot defend against the throw at all. If we bring up our pal, the frame meter here, those purple numbers 
Those are the actual parry, and as long as you hold it, it will be purple, right? This should show your parrying. And the blue part's the recovery. So basically, the recovery means you can't do anything. So ideally, you should be hit by anything, right? Well, not so much. Even when you are recovering, you are still allowed to block, no matter what. It doesn't matter if it says you're recovering, 100% of the time, 100 times out of 100, you are always allowed to block in that recovery. So that's great. Like the game will trick you, the game will trick you. Because if you're recovering and you get hit and don't do anything, it'll say punish countered. Like somehow you could not avoid it. But yes, rest assured, 100 times out of 100, no matter the state you're in, you're always allowed to block. But you are not allowed to tech throws. So if you are in that parry recovery state, no matter what, I can be jamming tech all day long, right? You can probably hear me mashing those buttons, right? No matter what, I cannot tech that throw. So throws are guaranteed against parries, both while you're in the parry animation and while you're recovering from the parry animation. The parry animation obviously defeats all strikes and the parry recovery, you're still allowed to block, but in no way can you defend yourself from a throw. And also as a punish counter, Throws will do more damage as well, so watch out for that. So parry defends against every form of attack, but it loses to throws. Also to note about parry's beating strikes, it also beats all tricks. So it doesn't matter if they go high, it doesn't matter if they go low, whatever, left, right, parry beats everything. So that cross up, I didn't have to guess left or right. If you're in a situation where you feel you have to guess left or right, high or low, just parry instead. Parry gets every possible opportunity. High, low, left, right, it doesn't matter. It'll auto-correct to whatever it needs to be. It beats everything, once again, but throws. So basically think of it as like block plus plus. Has all those advantages. You don't lose your drive gauge when you block. Instead, you gain drive gauge because of the parry. Beats overheads, lows, left and right, so it's all good. And also, when you defend against move, it also decreases the pushback just a little bit. So the enemy will be a bit closer to you. So ideally, it'll be a little bit easier to take your turn back. Now, of course, that's not all, because parry has one super advantage to it. That is the perfect parry. Okay, so that seems significant, right? The screen stopped. There's all sorts of cool colors all over. So that was a perfect parry. And perfect parry, well, is both simple and difficult. To get a perfect parry, you have to parry within the first two frames of the startup of the parry. So the move attack, it doesn't matter where it is, as long as it connects with your perfect parry in the first two frames. And yes, that has to be manually timed. If you do like some sort of frame perfect setup where you wake up and you hold the button and it'll do it automatically, it still won't work. It has to be within you pressing those buttons in the first two frames. And if you do, then you get the perfect parry. So this punch we saw can do. Normally, well, he's negative two and with pushback. So like, even if we wanted to, we could not punish him. It's just not possible. We have no move that's fast enough to punish it directly. Like he would be able to block in time every single time. With the perfect parry though, not so much. Now all of a sudden it says punish counter, that was guaranteed. We get guaranteed combos on moves that otherwise would never give a guaranteed combo. There we go. Now the one thing you might notice is it doesn't do much damage. So this move right here, the damage looks like that, but if we do the perfect parry, not quite as much. Due to the fact that it gives guaranteed combos in situations that are never otherwise possible, the damage does scale a little bit. So you won't do as much damage as you normally would. That's just a balance mechanic. But yeah, it is difficult to get a perfect parry. You have to really know when it's coming. Cause once again, it's a two frame window. That's a 30th of a second, right? You have to know. You're not just gonna mash and hope and get, well, okay, I guess sometimes you could. That's just luck, that's just luck, right? But most of the time you're not gonna mash and get it, right? But yeah, it gives you a very powerful turn the tables mechanic on attacks that you definitely know are coming for sure. And of course, if you just whiff it, then you're gonna look stupid, you're gonna get thrown, and that's not gonna work out too good for you. But yeah, so the parry, very powerful defensive mechanic thanks to the drive gauge meter that everyone has, and it works the same for every character. So now let's talk the drive impact. So this is your two heavy buttons, heavy punch, heavy kick together. And you get this. You get a whole bunch of color all around your character and a big old hit. So the thing that's the real magic of this is, well, something like this. The move is armored. It can take a hit. And not only that, it can take two hits. And not only that, the armor starts up immediately as soon as you press the button. 
So it's basically a defensive mechanic every character in the game has and can all use. So there's no situations where like one character might be able to have a defensive mechanic, other ones can't, everyone can do it. And it's probably gonna be the mechanic that's gonna drive you up the wall the most. It's great when you get it off, because if you eat someone's move and hit them on the other end, you can hit them, it's a guaranteed hit. And you can get combos and all that from it. Point to fact, you can get some pretty decent combos in fact. You, you can stack up some damage, right? If you nail the drive impact. So it's a very game changing mechanic. So let's talk about some more particulars here. One, while it's very strong, it has multiple hits of armor and can lead to full combos if you armor through someone's move and hit them on the other end of it, it is a bit slow. Not super slow, but slow enough that if you see it, you might be able to react to it. Like that. Like I saw it coming, so I reacted to it. But more importantly is there's a counterplay mechanic. If someone's going crazy on that drive impact, which can be frustrating, if you drive impact their drive impact, the game knows what's up and it enters a big slowdown state. And basically, long story short, whoever does drive impact second always wins. They'll tank through the first person with their own armor, hit them on the other end, and once again, you get your own combo. So if people are going crazy abusing it over and over, it's as literally as simple as you hit it back and you're gonna get a big win. And they are gonna lose the meter they invested in it. And in fact, they're gonna lose even more meter from the counter hit here. You can see here, Lanka is down almost two and a half bars from that scenario. So it's a very strong mechanic, but if you get called out on it specifically, it's rough. So something to note here, super moves always beat drive impact, as long as it hits. A super, no matter what, will always break armor. It doesn't matter how many hits of armor there are, so keep that in mind. The drive impact has two hits of armor, but this one hit beats it, and that's gonna be the cross board. Every super, level one, level two, level three, as long as it can hit, it'll always beat the armor on drive impact. And since drive impact's slower, like anything else, you can throw people out of it. Like, as long as you're not challenging the armor, and armor throws don't care about armor, right? So you can also throw people out of it, keep that in mind. If you catch yourself in a position where like you are going for combos and then you get hit, keep in mind, as long as a move is special cancelable, like as long as it can go to just any special move at all, then it can also automatically always go into drive impact. Now you're there. So so I did my two crouching leg punches because like I wanted to go for a combo, something like this. But since I caught him, oh, he's doing drive impact. I have enough time because of uh, the slowdown because the armor flash to just, you know, react to it like, Oh, I gotta hit my button back, right? Now, it's always, not always gonna be that easy, right? It's time sensitive, but yeah. There's many ways to deal with the drive impact. It can be frustrating, straight up, but there's many ways to deal with it. And of course, it's really strong, so I highly suggest you use it as well. Don't be the one frustrated by it. Try to be the guy that frustrates the other person with it. And also to note, drive impact always, always takes meter from the enemy. So sometimes if you know you're going to get a combo that hits, it might be worthwhile just to do a bit less damage, but drain that bar from them. Because without bar, you're like Blanca and you just can't do too much, right? So in those scenarios, if you can sniff it out, it's worth it just to drain their meter. So yeah, drive impact, very, 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 very strong mechanic. And that's before we even get to the corner. So when you're blocking, you're for the most part safe, right? Maybe you're losing some of that drive gauge, but whatever. And if you block a drive impact, you get pushed back a bit, right? But that's not the end of the world, right? You At least you didn't get blown up. But the problem is if you block a drive impact near the corner, you bounce off the corner. You, you successfully blocked. You didn't do the bad thing. Like you blocked, you did the right thing. But the problem is drive impact doesn't care if you did the right thing or not. So if you get drive impacted and uh, bounce off the corner, this is the damage you might take just for successfully blocking. So that whole thing where like someone drive impacts you and you re react back to the drive impact to stop them, that's more than just a gotcha. Against a corner, this is a survival mechanism. Because once again, too, you can cancel normals into that drive impact. So even if you block that string, if you just stood there and blocked the whole time, you get bounced and you're going to die. Like, in worst case scenarios, the enemy can just dump everything on you, right? Is this a good feeling because you blocked? Hey, hey. Not really, you're gonna take a lot of damage. So, 
in the corner, drive impact is the scariest thing. So you absolutely have to watch out for it. This mechanic, probably more than the other drive mechanics combined, is the one to watch out for. So now let's talk the drive rush. This is another super important mechanic and also very critical for all sorts of combos. It comes in two flavors, the raw drive rush, raw in that you just do it by itself, and the drive rush cancel, where you do it canceled from another move. They mostly do the same thing, it's just that the costs are different. So to do a raw drive rush, you need to hold your parry button first, the two mediums as we went over. And when you're in parry, just hit forward, forward, dash, that's it. So the parry takes half of one drive bar, and to do the drive rush out of the parry, takes another half of the drive bar. So basically one full drive bar when it's all said and told. Now for the drive rush cancel, all you need to do is take a normal move that you could otherwise cancel into a special move. Like say for Jamie, crouch medium punch goes into specials, so therefore it'll work. And when you do that move, just hit forward, forward. And you drive rush, just like the regular drive rush here, right? The difference here though, the regular drive rush costs one bar in total. This will always take three bars. So it's a much more expensive option, but it also leads to much longer combos and well, just the world in general. Now, this is gonna be another section where the frame data meter comes up as the drive rush changes everything on frames. So let's take, say, just stand medium punch, plus five frames if it connects. If you do it off a drive rush, it comes plus nine. Every hit, no matter what the hit is, any button, take whatever the number would be on hit or on block and add four frames of advantage to it. So now say stand medium kick is negative three. So slight disadvantage on block. But if you do it off the drive rush, it's now plus one. So before, if you did this, it's time to start blocking because if you hit a button, you're gonna get hit out of it. However, here in this scenario, it's your turn. So you can hit a button and they're the ones that have to watch out. So it always adds four frames of advantage no matter what. You don't have to know every single number, but just generally think of it this way. If it's off a drive rush, it's just gonna be better than it was normally, either on hit or on block. And changing those numbers, it's very important. Let me give you a Jamie specific example. So Jamie has an overhead, forward and medium kick. So this is a move you have to block standing. If you block crouching, you get bopped in the head. So it's negative on block, obviously enough. And if it hits, well, you have slight advantage, but not much else. However, if you do it off the drive rush, those extra five frames of advantage you'd get, well, geez louise, it says plus five now instead of plus one. My crouch light punch is only four frames, so therefore, do a little simple math here, and now we get a whole combo. So before, without a drive rush, this is where it ends. It starts and stops right here. If you get the hit, great, but that's it. But with the drive rush and the additional advantage, now it turns this move into a combo move, which is very, very strong. And a lot of characters work under these properties. You can take a move that's good enough by itself, but it becomes a combo move if you use it off a raw drive rush. So now also we mentioned how you can cancel the drive rush from attacks, right? So it lets you come up with all new combo routes. So let's give you a basic example first. So say with Jamie, basic hit confirm combo, right? If I see it connects, I just go into my special move. Pretty as you please, right? But if we wanna get more damage and more hits in, instead of just going right into the special, we can go into the drive rush. And right here, after the punch, I can drive rush cancel and get another punch in. And keep in mind that other punch has more advantage, right? Just like we talked about earlier, every move off the drive rush, even if it's off the cancel, will do more damage. So now, normally, stand light punch, plus five frames, but off the drive rush, plus nine frames. You know what's nine frames? His crouch heavy punch, which is one of his most damaging normals. So now, instead of this, we can get something like this. We get another attack in, and we can use the heavier version of the special move that does more damage. So it costs us some of our drive meter, yes, but we're just strictly doing more damage and being more successful with the combo. And you can do this off longer combo, shorter combo. So example here, crouch, heavy punch, crouch, medium punch for DJ is a natural combo. And since crouch, medium punch is special cancelable, well, we can drive rush from it. And since drive rush will give us advantage frames, we'll do a medium punch 
And regular medium punch is five frames. Drive rush medium punch, nine frames. That crouch heavy punch is eight frames, so therefore it'll work. And yeah, we can just keep going. Nothing says you can only do it one time. You, as long as you can keep the drive gauge going, you can keep drive rushing and comboing and comboing. Now, another thing is the drive rush, as we went over, you know, we can cancel it from a move, but you can actually use the raw drive rush in combos as well. So in this scenario with DJ, we have the launcher move and yeah, we can juggle after the fact, that's easy. However, after the juggle, if we just raw drive rush forward, we can and combo from there. And all of a sudden, our combo's longer, more combo potential, more damage, all that kind of stuff. So cancels are great, but you can also use the raw drive rush and combos as well and use less meter because it's still only gonna cost one overall bar. And as another bonus, as if there weren't enough bonuses, a drive rush lets you juggle moves that normally don't juggle. So that scenario we used here with the launcher, right? We used the stand heavy punch for DJ. And stand heavy punch, you better believe, doesn't juggle in this scenario. It just literally doesn't juggle. It cannot connect. It's only when we drive rush it and give it the enhanced struggle properties that it will juggle. And it basically makes every move have juggle properties no matter if it has it normally or not. Some moves, some special moves can juggle no matter what. They're just built in, but most moves can't. But when you drive rush, everything can juggle. So that's the secret. And you can use this fact to create combos that are just otherwise, well, strictly not possible by the regular rules of the game. So drive rush in so many ways. The cancel version, the regular raw version is super great. And not the least of which, you can just do stupid gimmicks. Like I can do this, run forward. And if you're scared, I'm gonna block and say, nah, I'm just gonna throw you instead, right? And for characters with command grabs, that's a much more important deal. So the drive rush is also just like the drive parry, just like the drive impact, super critical and super, super important. And we have one last drive system. It's the most boring, it's the least sexy one. And a lot of times it's gonna be the single most important one that's gonna save you and make you maybe win games, otherwise you're gonna lose. And that's the drive reversal. So the drive reversal has to do with you blocking specifically. And when you're blocking, it's just like drive impact basically. Hit forward and the two heavy buttons at the same time. And when the enemy is attacking you, when you're blocking, it's basically a big get off me. So it comes with a cost. It does take two of your drive meters. And if you're blocking, you probably got hit naturally enough. So you're losing whatever drive meter you lost on top of getting hit. But sometimes you need to get off me. So I'm using Lily as a great example here. She has her Condor Spire that's enhanced. And if you block it, you're negative one. So therefore she's plus one, which doesn't seem like a lot, but she has a very devastating mix up that she can do to you if you block this. And you have no real way out of it other than hope you guess right. So that's scary, that's very scary. But you don't have to deal with it. You can stop it before it starts with the drive reversal. If you start blocking that enhanced Condor Spire, just drive reversal right away. And yes, you lose some of your gauge, absolutely. But now you don't have to deal with that mix up. And it applies for anything you block. It can be a bigger hit. It can be a smaller hit. You can always do it. Although keep in mind, this is very important for moves that are very quick and recover fast, the enemy might have time to block in time. And at a lot of ranges, it's not necessarily punishable, but you'll be negative. So keep that in mind. It's not so good against quick moves, but against the big home run swings that you definitely don't want to take, this is your get off me move. And once again, it's boring, it's not sexy, it's not cool. It's not like the neat combos you can do off drive rush or the big single hits like the drive impact we talked about but this might actually save your life. So now we've brought it up a couple times in the video now, but we gotta give it its own section, is throws. Throws are a big part of Street Fighter. At the bare minimum, a throw, well, it's your lights together. Light punch, light kick, and you go for the throw. And if it connects, well, you throw them. Simple as that, right? So blocking, obviously a part of Street Fighter. And 
moves are defeated by the block. If they block, a bunch of different things can happen maybe, but they block. They're not taking damage. But what you cannot block is a throw. So it's really that simple. Attacks are defeated by blocks, but blocks are defeated by throws. The thing is, the basic throw, everyone has a basic throw. Some people's are better than others, do different things. Uh, Zangief specifically has a wide variety of basic throws. Uh, he's got more than a few, and that's very much by design. But uh, every basic throw can be teched. And teching a throw is literally as simple as when they throw you, you throw them back. So if two throws connect at roughly the same time, you'll get a throw tech. And then there will be a large amount of space created between the two players, kind of reset the neutral. And that's about it. So that's the call out. The enemy doesn't necessarily hurt you for calling out the throw, but they do reset their position and you're far away. So throws beat blocks, but if you smell a throw coming and throw yourself, you tech the throw and you get out of dodge. Now where you don't get out of dodge, and this is why we picked Zangief as our example, is what we call command grabs. These are grabs that are special moves. And command grabs, for the most part, do a lot more damage than a regular grab, and you cannot defend against these in any way. There is no teching a command grab. The only way to get out of the command grab is to be in a throw invincible state, which is either jumping. You can't command grab a person who's jumping. Well, unless it's an air command grab. And backdashing. Backdashes are throw invincible. So all things equal, command grabs are pretty much across the board better than regular throws. That's why certain characters like, say, Zangief, who have command grabs, they have a lot of negatives to balance it out. They're usually slow or have a bunch of penalties because command grabs are some of the scariest things you can see in Street Fighter 6, especially this version of Street Fighter because uh, the average grab does a lot more damage than it used to in older games. So you got to really, really, really watch out. And for one final bonus is the reason I have JP picked here. Sometimes, and for one final bonus, just because I have JP picked here, sometimes all throws aren't exactly what you think. So JP has all sorts of ranged attacks, and one of those ranged attacks is a throw. It's straight up an actual throw. You cannot defend against it. So for him specifically, if they think, you know, they're going to block all my moves from screen, I'm sick of them blocking all my projectiles. Throws come in all sorts of shapes and sizes these days, right? So even fireballs can be a throw in Street Fighter VI. Now, let's talk jumps. If you're newer, you're going to jump a lot and attack the enemy, and they're going to jump at you and a lot to attack you, right? It's just how it's going to happen. Why? Because jumps are very rewarding. If they don't get stopped, the combo will do more damage. You're directly on top of the enemy, probably with advantage, and you're just in a good position all around. So when jumps happen, you got to stop it. Like, it's not negotiable. But the thing is, how do we do it? So a lot of characters that have what we call a Shoryuken-style move, like something that reaches high up and attacks while they're in the air, moves like that, for the most part, not only do they beat jumps, they're invincible against jumps. How do you know? Well, one thing that's very handy is if you go into the move list here, it'll usually give you an idea if a move is good against jumps or not. Like, say, for Lily's Tomahawk Buster, it's invincible against jumping attacks, making it useful as an anti-air. So make sure you go into the menus and see, okay, what's the description say? If it says it's good against jumps, well, it's probably good against jumps. So learning your anti-jump moves is very important no matter what. It's, it's good. But the thing is, a lot of characters have moves that are good against jumps that aren't as apparent. Like Lily, this move here, conking you with the club. Doesn't seem like an anti-jump move, but... It's actually an amazing anti-jump move. Because not only does it connect, you can go into combos after the fact. So a lot of characters, you have to test move by move. Sometimes it's easy and the game just sort of spells it up for you. See how Kami just punches directly straight into the air? Well, it may be a shocker, but yeah, a move that attacks directly straight into the air winds up being an exceptional anti-air. So if you see something like this, Assume it's an anti-air, you're probably correct in your assumption. Some characters also have special moves that are very strong against air attacks that you wouldn't think so otherwise, like say Zangief's spinning Lariat. It doesn't have that uppercut style motion, but you better believe it is very good against air attacks. 
So it doesn't always have to look like it's a good move against jumps to be a good move against jumps. And of course, well, some moves, like say Zangief's level one super, are tailor-made to destroy jumps. So keep that in mind. So to defeat jumps, it's something you're probably gonna have to hit training mode for. It's hard to figure out sometimes in the middle of the battle, but pick your character, just go through all their moves. You can set the dummy like I am to jumps, and maybe just set them to jump and attack you and try it out. Sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's not so obvious, but it's always rewarding. So now we're gonna talk about counter hits and punish counters. So we're gonna have our pal frame data meter show up again. So we're gonna take a basic move here. We're gonna take stand medium kick for Menno. And if it hits, we're actually negative. We're negative two. That's not very good. But say we were to counter hit the enemy. So I say, I know Ryu's gonna come out and hit a button, right? He does that and I knock him out of it, counter hit. And now we're at zero frames of advantage. Okay. So plus two, counter hitting the enemy, hitting them while they're in the middle of the move before the move comes out, gives you always two additional frames of advantage. Now say I know he's gonna do that move, I'll let him complete the move and hit him when it's done. That's what we call a punish counter. And now we're plus two. So that gives four frames of advantage compared to the two from a counter hit. So it's actually better to hit the enemy when they're done their move rather than before their move. So why is this applicable? Well, let me give you an example. So using some of what we learned earlier in the video, we're gonna use a drive rush and attack from it, making the move more advantage on block than it normally would. So this can lead to some advantageous situations. So the enemy sets the attack right after they block, right? So here, since we have advantage frames, we're gonna go for a stand jab. And because we have the advantage, we're always gonna win. But since the stand jab is hitting as a counter hit, it has more frame advantage than normal, which means it can now combo into stand like kick. Normally, it could never combo into stand like kick. And of course, naturally from there, just to complete the thought, right? We can get a whole little combo going. But yeah, normally that would never connect. But since we're in a position where we know, since we have the advantage, whatever we do is gonna win. If they hit a button, we hit a button, we win. And since we won, we got the counter hit. And since we got the counter hit, we have additional frame advantage. And since we have additional frame advantage, and I know I'm going on here, but I'm sorry, but this is how this works. Then we can go into combos we normally never otherwise could. So this is things why counter hits is important. If you know you're both gonna hit buttons at the same time, you can start going for combo routes that are actually more effective than your normal basic combos. Now, punish counter is much the same, just even more frame advantage. And punish counters are guaranteed anytime their opponent's recovering from a move. So say you're up against Ryu and he just goes for that uppercut and you blocked. Well, that means your next hit, no matter how big or how small, is a punish counter. Therefore also gets four additional frames of advantage. So since we have Manon here, normally Manon, her spin kick, it's very difficult to combo into. Like even from her heavier buttons, it doesn't naturally combo. But since the punish counter gives us such additional frame advantage, it does become a combo. And now since we know that combos, we can just kind of take it to the next level and finish our combo from there, right? So this is a combo, not, not possible, unless we get a punish counter. So that's good. It allows for combos you normally can't do. But punish counter also has an entirely different layer. Take stand heavy kick. So that's good enough. And if it hits as a punish counter, See that? It's a new effect. It's like a gunshot went off. And not only does that just mean the additional frame advantage, it means you can do some fun things. Oh, I caught you whiffing. I hit you from far away. And now I have enough advantage, thanks to that extra special animation, that I can just go into my ballerina kicks and connect. It's more than being plus four. Once again, normal counter is plus two, punish counter plus four. Normally on hit, this thing is negative two. So if it was plus four, it would just be plus two, which could never let you combo into a move like this. It's much too slow. However, with a punish counter giving you an all new unique effect, now it can. Many characters have a move that has a very specific effect on punish counter. That's more than just you get additional frames or not, like say this move for Guile. Say for someone like E Honda, this is one of his more optimal ways to combo because this causes a knockdown. Normally, obviously it never would. And with this in mind, we can now go for bigger and better combos. So that helps a lot. Some are tied to moves that have very specific situations like Chun-Li's forward heavy kick. Chun-Li's forward heavy kick is very tailor-made to beat people who go for crouching lows a lot. 
And as you can see, you can see that effect go off, right? And this means if you did the call out and you got him, you get combos. That's great. And this move also comes up with the idea of whiff punishing. So right there, we let the enemy whiff the move and we attack them on the other end of it and we got some damage. For whiff punishing, it's literally as simple as it sounds. The enemy whiffs and you punish the whiff. So this is something you want to do a lot in the back and forth of Street Fighter. And as other sections as we went over, it's more than just a reward of you get the reward of hitting them. And that, that's good. That's good. It's very good, in fact. So I can get something like that just because I knew you're going to go for a crouch medium kick. I just walked backwards, let it miss, tapped your toe, punished the recovery of the move, and then all of a sudden you lost half your life, right? A lot of things are possible off simple whiff punishes. So that's a big example. And of course, you know, if we want to scale it down, we can just use that example again, right? Like, since I know you're going to go for the move, I can get my punish counter with the special effect and get a little combo, right? And yes, again, sometimes it is as simple as just getting that little poke in. But yeah, walk speeds in Street Fighter 6 are pretty good for the most part. And it is very viable just to let the enemy walk forward, try to go for their move. You let them miss their move and then you hit them on the other end of it. Simple, basic building block of Street Fighter, but very important. And in our final section, let's talk combos. So combos can be the hardest thing about Street Fighter in a lot of ways. If you come from other fighting games like Tekken or Mortal Kombat, it's very different. And of course, if you don't have any experience with fighting games, well, it's just plain hard. So let's talk first the absolute basic thing, chains. So some attacks, almost certainly lights. They just, as long as you just keep jamming the button, it comes out. This you don't have to worry about. And if you're eventually lucky enough, like, oh, I got my hit, I can go into my special move. So that part's easy. That's the easiest part. It gets more difficult from here. Now, not every move can be chained. Like, say, uh, Honda, some of his lights, yes. But not all of his lights. Like, stand light punch here, doesn't chain into itself. There's no combo. Versus crouch light punch, it does combo. So jamming on the button, depending on the button, might give you results. It might not give you results. And now here's where you might get confused. This is where old uh, pal frame data is going to help us is links. So Honda stand medium punch. If it connects, it has advantage of four frames. And you know what's four frames? Our crouching light punch. So therefore, that means that's a combo. And it's that simple. As long as you look at the numbers, you'll learn all the combos. It's really that simple. So four frames of advantage. This is four frames. One plus two equals combo. And therefore, we can go into a combo from there, right? So keep stuff like this in mind. These are the building blocks of Street Fighter. The frame data will definitely help you there. And like so many other things we talked about, things like drive rush, changing your frame data can create links where there normally wouldn't be. Normally, stand medium kick. While it could go into, say, Crouch Light Punch, it couldn't go into Heavy Kick. But if you Drive Rush it, it gives it additional frame advantage. Now it says plus eight. And now it would combo into the Stand Heavy Kick. So once again, the numbers tell you the whole story. As long as the amount of advantage is the same number as another move, that means that move will always combo as long as you're within range for the most part. And yes, certainly enough, we can hit the point where combos can get, well, elaborate and tricky, right? No one's asking you to do uh, this combo day one or anything. But a lot of what combo making is, is a combination of just everything we've done in this video so far. The frame data, once again, we talked about how moves that normally can't juggle, can juggle with a drive rush in the drive rush section. So say this move for Honda, we cannot land that stand heavy punch, no matter what. But if we use a drive rush, we can. And stand heavy punch goes in a hundred hand slap. So normally, once again, no heavy punch, no hundred hand slap. But if we drive rush first, we get heavy punch, we get hundred hand slap. And it can be any flavor you want. It can be a lowly jab. Just heavy punch does more jam damage, right? Anything off a drive rush will always juggle. So when you're making combos with juggles, please keep that in mind. And some characters have special effects or statuses that change combos. Like Honda, if you have his buff up, 
you can extend his hundred hand slap and get a move after it and keep comboing. And once again, using that combo as our base, the logic and example. Hundred hand slap, extend after the fact, and then drive rush cancel. Because we can drive rush cancel any move that's special cancelable. Drive rush cancel jab has eight frames of advantage, which means it links into stand heavy kick. Stand heavy kick goes into the launcher, and from the launcher, we can use our raw drive rush to get the combo. And these are all the building blocks. Sometimes, yes, it is as simple as, oh, light, light, uppercut, right? Sometimes it's not. But just keep this in mind. Most lights can chain. That means if you just jam on the button, it'll just keep going into itself. And if you do, and you see it hit, you can go for a special move. And for more advanced things, then there's the numbers and there's the links. So like, stand heavy kick is nine frames of advantage, which means since crouch medium kick is nine or less, it's eight. It means it'll always work. It's really that simple as math. And since crouch medium kick goes in the EX Tatsu, that'll work. So then, okay, block one, block two, block three. I also know EX Tatsu in the corner happens to go into the big uppercut, right? So now, let's put all the pieces together. Piece one, piece two, piece three, piece four. Oh, and now for one final piece, I happen to know that if I'm in the corner, his heavy Shoryuken will go into his level three super and it'll get me a lot more damage. So that no, once again, rewind. So now we put all the pieces together and it just works, right? So next up, let's talk the supers because supers have weird rules about combo ability. So a thing to note before anything else, if you can get a super in a juggle, don't worry about it. Supers juggle almost always. Doesn't matter level one, two, three. If it's in a juggle, don't worry about the rules. But now let's talk the rules. Level one supers work from normals that are special cancelable, but that's about it. Crouch, medium, kick, and the fireball. The old Ryu classic, right? Since I'm doing a special move at the end, I cannot go into my super, my level one, my Shinko Hadoka. I can do it from the medium kick, because it's a normal, but if I add the special, no dice. In fact, the only thing that combos off regular specials is a level three super. So not level ones, not level twos. You gotta bet the whole bank if you wanna go normal into special into super. Only level threes will allow you to do it. Unless once again, you are get a juggle. Juggles, that's fine. Now level twos cannot go from specials, but what they can do is go from EX moves, as you can see here. So basically, if you want to do a level two in a combo, you have to commit a bit of your drive gauge meter on an overdrive move. You'll still get a lot of damage. It'll still work out very much in your favor, but this is the one basically where you have to burn the most amount of your resources. So once again, level one supers only go off normals. Level two supers do work off special moves, but it has to be an EX special move. And level three supers work off any special move, no matter what. Now, keep in mind, just because it's a special move, doesn't mean you're guaranteed to cancel into a level three. Like Honda's butt slams airborne for most of it, and his level three is decidedly not airborne, right? So that's not gonna work. And say his sumo headbutt, which will let you cancel into it, will only let you cancel into it in the beginning. If you're far away, it's not gonna work. So now, in this example here, let's do it full screen. And it's just not gonna work. Some special moves, it'll only let you cancel into the super at the very beginning of the move. So please keep that in mind, test it out for yourself. I do highly, highly, highly recommend you going into the combo trials as there's great combos for every character and it'll give you an idea of what you wanna look for. It'll teach you both the building blocks of combos and some of the better combos that you'll use in a real match. So please check out the combo trials. And that's about the basics. There's still so much more to talk about. Street Fighter is a pretty complex game and uh, I definitely didn't cover every single aspect of the game. There's still a lot more, but this is enough to get your feet wet. This is enough to help you understand how the basics work. So in that aspect, I hope this video has helped you out. That said, well, I guess we're at the end of the video now. So thank you very much for watching. Hope this video has found you well and go out and play some Street Fighter.